Hey guys, I know a lot of you struggle with performance anxiety. Guess what? I do too. I even have a tiny little bit of anxiety about performing for you right here. Hey. But on a serious note, you know, I'm talking about performance anxiety in the bedroom. This is something that I myself have sort of struggled with. Maybe I won't say struggle, but no, you know what? Fuck it. There has been a lot of moments of complete and utter struggle and feelings of like, oh my God, my dick isn't going to work. I have developed a whole lot of techniques and things that I do. And more than anything, it's just not putting pressure on myself to perform. Kind of the only way to win here is to not play the game. The only winning move is not to play. And so when you're feeling that anxiety of like, fuck, I have to perform, I have to do a good job, I have to please her, I have to make her orgasm, I have to do all of this. If you're getting yourself really worked up about that to the point where you're not even sure if you can actually enjoy the sex, the trick is to just say, you know what, fuck it, I'm not going to even perform then. I'm just going to see what happens. I'm just going to go into the bedroom with her and have a decent time and see what happens. I don't have to do a good job. It's okay if she thinks I'm shit in bed. I can be very honest with that, with that, with her and tell her, you know, I'm worried that you'll think I'm bad in bed. I have this anxiety. I put pressure on myself to perform. You can even reach out to her and say, you know, do you ever put pressure on yourself? And guess what? 99.9% .9 of the women are going to tell you, yes, of course I do. I'm a human. Insecurity is kind of part of being human. So what I want to do here is go over some of the thoughts that have come into my head over the years in those moments where I've put a lot of pressure on myself and also some of the moments or some of the thoughts that my clients have had and have expressed to me. So I feel like I can't relax and enjoy myself because I'm so worried about performing well. It's like I'm constantly under pressure to satisfy my partner. Yeah, it's like I just said that. I, I've had this thought so many times, particularly the first couple of times I ever had a threesome. I put all this pressure on myself that like, holy shit, now I have to please two women. I have to make sure two women are having a good time at once. And I've had a lot of coaching clients that have gone through that exact same thing with threesomes. And by the way, we're not just talking about threesomes, but threesomes seem to really bring up because it's magnified. It's literally twice as much that feeling that sort of, I think it's more a masculine feeling, but women feel this too. That masculine feeling of, I have to be good. I have to do, I have to like be what I'm supposed to be. I have to please her. I have to perform. I have to be a dancing monkey that does a good job and make sure that the sex is wonderful and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, I've had so many clients that have sort of felt like they literally can't even relax and enjoy the actual sex because they're so up here thinking I have to do a good job. I have to satisfy her and not just satisfy her, but I have to constantly satisfy her. In other words, or, or here's something that really helped me was when I sort of stepped back a little bit and said, what bad thing happens if I don't please her? Like, let's say there's five minutes where she's not really enjoying herself. What bad thing happens? What am I so afraid of? What am I so terrified of? And if any of you sort of have performance anxiety, I recommend you do the same exercise. Ask yourself, what am I so afraid of? Like what bad thing is going to happen? What am I so scared will happen? What am I trying to defend against? What am I trying to prevent? And you play that out. And for me, it was something like this. It was, if there's even just 10 minutes where she's not having fun, then she'll lose attraction for me and she won't want to be with me anymore. And so you, some of you might have that same thought. And by the way, this video very much applies to women as well. A lot of women have performance anxiety. I can't tell you how many women have said to me, I hope I'm doing a good job. I really want to please you. I just want to be good for you. I, I, I want you to think I'm pretty. So it's not just a masculine thing, but I think guys put a little bit more pressure on themselves to act and perform. So in those, you, you play that out, that exercise of what am I so afraid of? Some of you might reach the same conclusion that I did. I'm terrified that she'll lose attraction and then she won't like me. Okay. And then what? Like what happens then? Okay. Well, God, I'm worried that she won't like me. She won't find me attractive and she'll eventually stop having sex with me and she'll either break up with me or she'll cheat on me or she'll just, I don't know, tell her friends that I'm bad in bed or she'll just look at me differently or she'll secretly hate me or she'll say passive aggressive things to me or she'll be disgusted by me, like something like that. Okay. And then what? Okay. Well, you know, she'll leave me and then God, I guess I'll be all alone. And then maybe I'll just get with another woman and God, the same thing will happen. You know, she, this, I'll go through the same shit because I'm not good at performing. She won't like me. She won't be attracted to me and she'll break up with me. Okay. And then what? 
And at this point, some of you, like me and myself, when I then say, and then what, I realized, wait, well, I can just like get better at sex. Like if I just, pra if, if enough women said that I wasn't doing a good job, that I wasn't performing, and really, it's usually not the women that are saying this. Like our partners rarely tell us like you're doing a bad job. They'll just say like, can we try this? Or do you want to try this? Or could we do it? Could you do it a bit rougher? Right? It's the pressure that we put on ourselves and most performance or all performance, most performance anxiety is coming from you. It's usually not the other person thinking that you're doing a bad job. But at that point, you know, when I played out this game of, and then what happens next, I get to that point where I'm like, you know, a bunch of women will leave me because they're not attracted to me. I can just improve at sex. Like surely if like 10 women in a row didn't want to sleep with me because I was so fucking bad at sex, couldn't I just practice and get a little bit better? Wouldn't I have learned something through those 10 women who all said like, and again, people won't tell you, they usually won't tell you like you're shit at sex, but you know, I would have learned something through this experience of having 10 women in a row leave me for my poor performance. Okay, that would probably be a really good learning experience. I'd probably get pretty decent at sex. And so when I made that switch in my head or when I re had that realization, that epiphany, I was like, fuck, okay, maybe I can just practice sex. So in other words, what I'm talking about here is rather than saying, I have performance anxiety, I'm so worried about doing a good job. That's having a losing mindset, right? Flip it around. You know, we talk about this on this channel all the time. We're here to play to win. We're here to win. Flip it around and play to win. How would you win? Okay, I will improve at sex. Any women that I sleep with, I will tell them, or any women that I'm dating, I will tell them, hey, listen, I don't have a lot of experience. I'm still learning. I'm really excited to try new things. I want to explore my bucket list. I want to explore yours. I want to try some kinky stuff. I want to, you know, try different positions. I want to learn how to please you. So could you tell me how to please you? Like literally tell me what feels good. If something doesn't feel good, will you tell me? Like I want to get fucking nerdy about this sex shit. And that's that switch that I made in my mind. I at some point became like fucking autistically nerdy about sex. Like I'm a sex nerd. You guys have to understand. I'm a fucking nerd about sex. <clears throat> I know so much shit about sex. I can't even begin to fucking tell you how much shit I know. Like I could write you a fucking 500. I mean, look at the Tinder guide. Look how much shit I put into the, the, the Tinder guide. I wrote an entire fucking book, two books and a video course on how to have threesomes. I'm really nerdy about this shit because at that point when I played this exercise out of, you know, what am I so afraid of? When I hit that point of fuck, I can just get good at sex. I became a fucking nerd about it. And so many of you watching are complete and utter fucking nerds. You are, you guys are so fuck. I swear to God, we have the nerdiest community. And I love that. That is your superpower. Use that nerdiness, go all in with sex, be honest with the women that you're dating or sleeping with and literally tell them, yo, I want to become a fucking sex nerd. Do you want to become a sex nerd with me? And most women are going to be like, yes, that sounds amazing. <laughs> Especially if you're being non-judgmental, right? Like, do you know how many women want to explore their sexuality? Do you know how many people want to explore their sexuality, but they're repressed by fears of like, what if I'm judged? What if I'm a slut? What if, you know, I say something that the other person isn't into and I, I gross them out or something. And so if you can switch that in your mind and just become a fucking hyper sex nerd, you don't have to worry so much about performance anxiety because you're like, it's fine. I can be shit at this thing and I'll just improve. And so that was something else that helped me really embracing that idea of giving myself permission to suck with sex and just going, right, I'm a level zero newbie. I want to get to a level 60 sex God. Okay. Right now I don't know how to do half of the sex shit. I don't know how to be smooth. I don't always know how to make a woman feel good. Fine. I can just learn. I can ask lots of questions. I can say, does that feel good? Do you want to try this? What about this? What should I do? Give me some tips. And women are very forthcoming. People are very forthcoming with that sort of stuff if you ask for it. So yeah, that was some stuff that really helped me. Now you might try this exercise of, you know, playing out your fears to their logical conclusion, like I said, and you might get to that point that I got to where you go, you know, I'm terrified that, 10 women in a row or 10 guys in a row, 10 people in a row will not want to sleep with me and say I did a bad job and they'll leave me. Right. And then you might go and that's terrifying and I can't have that. Okay. What next? What would happen next? Well, you know, then I would be forever alone and nobody would ever sleep with me. And I'd just go through all of these relationships and these casual, you know, sex partners and no one would like me and I'd end up alone and sad and I'd have no one. 
Okay, and then what? And usually when I get people to sit there in that moment, if you can sit there in that space and actually just sit with your fear, your biggest fear, because your biggest fear is that, right? It's being alone. Why are you afraid of being alone? Like, what does that mean? What would that tell about you? Would that mean that you have failed at life? Is it a fear of death? You know, if I'm alone, then what if I slip in the shower and I fall down and I die and, or I sl slip in the fucking bathtub and there's nobody there for me and I end up dying alone. Like, like ask yourself what you are so afraid of, because a lot of our fears, maybe most of our fears is really just a fear of like the unknown, right? You can also say it's like a fear of death if you play it out to its logical conclusion, but let's just sit with most fears are a fear of the unknown, right? You're terrified because you haven't done this exercise of playing it out to its logical conclusion. And so you feel this performance anxiety or this fear of not doing a good job, this fear of not being able to perform or not being able to get an erection or not being pretty enough if you're a woman, like this fear of performance and you've never really sat in it and explored what it actually means, what you're actually afraid of. And any fears that we haven't explored and we haven't, you know, walked them out to their logical conclusion, they're terrifying. They're so terrifying because the, again, the fear of the unknown is one of the strongest, biggest, scariest fears because you don't know what will happen. If you play it out like I just, the exercise I just gave you and say, what am I afraid of? What happens next? You know, what does that say about me? What am I so scared of? You play it out to its logical conclusion. It's actually a lot less scary. Like it is far less scary for me to think, oh, you know, I just, end up having a whole bunch of relationships and nobody would have sex with me. That's far less scary than if I haven't played that exercise out. And by the way, if you do play this exercise out, you walk it out to its logical conclusion. If you get to that end point of, you know, I'm afraid that 50 people in a row will sleep with me and say that I'm bad and I'll be forever alone and I'll die in the shower. If you at that point don't feel a little bit of a release, like a little bit of freedom, a little bit of calm wash over you, that's okay. That means that there are more fears underneath that you still haven't uncovered. And so, and be gentle with this, keep playing it out. You know, if you're just sitting there still in fear, put a label on that or, or investigate, inquire, try and figure out what's going on. Because again, fears aren't just a fear. We often, if we haven't, like I said, played it out to its conclusion, we feel like it's just a fear. Oh my God, I'm so scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm angry, I'm, I'm shy, I'm ashamed, I'm guilty. Like we feel the emotion, but underneath the emotion, there are stories or there are thoughts or there are other fears going on. There are other things at play. You don't just feel an emotion, you know, like fear or performance anxiety. You don't just feel it for no fucking reason. It's there for a reason. So we're trying to dig beneath the surface a little bit. And again, be gentle with this. This isn't about, about forcing yourself to not feel a fear. It's quite the opposite. We're sitting in that fear. We're sitting in that anxiety. So many guys and girls, especially my, you know, the coaching clients that come to me, they've felt all this like performance anxiety, but they've never actually just sat in it. And so I get them to sit with it if they're brave enough and, and pretty much everyone is, I get them to sit in it with me and sort of explain to me what is so bad about not getting an erection or what is so bad about your partner not feeling pleasure for 10 minutes because, you know, maybe you're being a little bit too rough or too gentle or whatever. Like what is so bad about that? In other words, what are you worried that it says about you? if you're not able to please your partner. So yeah, again, be gentle with this. If everything I just said, and by the way, there's plenty more in this video, I'm not finishing up now, <laughs> but if everything I've just said sort of resonates with you, but you feel like you'd like more help, I'm really happy to sit down. This is one of the topics that I'm like the most passionate about. We can either do, you know, the proper hardcore 12 week coaching program. I am at the moment, at the time of this recording, I'm still offering those um, 30 minute coaching calls, the one-off coaching calls, you know, one per person. So. I'd be really happy to go over this stuff. I really get excited about this shit. I love like playing out fears to their logical conclusion because I love seeing the freedom that comes, the clarity that comes for people when they go, holy fuck, I don't have to be afraid anymore. So yeah, links are in the description below to that. Let's talk about the next one that comes up a lot. Performance anxiety is tough because I feel like I'm not living up to expectations, both women's expectations and my own expectations. It's like, I'm not good enough or skilled enough to please a woman. Yeah, you see the key word there, and I've had so many guys say this, where they will basically say to me, you know, women have 
expectations, Andy, and I'll go, have you ever actually fucking asked any of them? Like, have you asked them what their expectations are? And it's usually expectations that we think our partner has, but we've never really checked, right? We're sitting over here on our own and we're almost treating the other person as if they're an enemy or they're the other. We've never actually pulled them over onto our team and said, hey, listen, I'm in my own head right now. I have this anxiety. Where are you at? Like, like, do you want me to be perfect? Do you expect that I should always please you every single second of our lovemaking? Should I just know all of the different sex positions and all the crazy shit and should I be good at that? Should I be smooth all the time? Like, what are your actual expectations of me? And if you actually ask and you actually check to see if the other person does have any of these expectations, oh my God, I swear to God, like 99.999% of the time, the other person says, no, I don't have any of those expectations of you, fuck. But I tell you what, I was actually putting those expectations on myself as well. Holy shit, we've both been here thinking that we both have to be perfect. We've both been putting all this pressure on ourselves. Jesus, should we just let all that go and have fun? I've had that conversation, like I swear to God, like 50, 100 fucking times, probably more than that if I count things outside of sex as well. So many times where I'm putting pressure on myself. You know, I've done that on coaching calls where I've said, guys, I put pressure on myself to be a really good coach for you guys. I'll tell you what right now. I am currently, as I speak right now, there's a little thought in the back of my head saying, you better do a good job with what you're saying. You better really help these fucking people. There are people suffering right now, Andy. You know, they have an expectation that their time is valuable and you better never waste their time and you better do a damn good job of giving all this free value. And I hear that voice and I've played that out to its logical conclusion. Like I said before, you know, what am I so afraid of? What happens if I ever do a video where I don't give a ton of value and all of that. But I'm sort of letting you know that that voice I think is there for all of us. And the real 420 IQ play, the real amazing realization is when you realize that voice can be a beautiful thing. Like I'm not even telling you that that voice, that performance anxiety is a bad thing. In fact, all of you right now, pause the fucking video and leave a comment telling me three reasons your performance anxiety is a good thing. I'll give you three right now of my own. I'll give you three of my own. My performance, you know, me, Andy, my performance anxiety in the bedroom, and to be clear, I feel very little of it now, but it still comes up from time to time. But my performance anxiety in the bedroom has helped me and motivated me to be a sex nerd and to get better. Hey, that's fucking beautiful. My performance anxiety in the bedroom means that I care. I empathize with my partner. I want to make sure they have a good time. That's fucking beautiful. My performance anxiety in the bedroom is me telling myself that I want to be better. It's me basically saying, it's me admitting to myself that I'm capable of more. It's an admission that I can be more, that self-improvement is right there for me. Holy shit, that's a beautiful realization. And so again, I encourage all of you to pause the video right now and come up with some reasons why performance anxiety can be a good thing. But to bring it back to this concern or this thought, you know, of worrying that people will have expect your partner will have expectations of you, just fucking ask them. So much of the time we live up here in our own head and we never actually check with reality. We never say, hey, reality, or hey, you know, partner, hey, other person, I think you have this expectation of me. Do you actually have that expectation of me? And I swear to God, like I said, 99% of the time, the other person will say, no, I fucking don't have that expectation of you. Another thing I've heard a lot and something that's been on my mind in the past when I've had anxiety is I worry that girls will get frustrated with me or leave me because of my performance anxiety. It's like I'm not able to give them what they want or need. Yeah, so you see that part there? That's why I said played out to its logical conclusion. If you have that fear of they're gonna leave me, they're gonna get pissed off and they're just gonna leave me. What is so bad about that? A book that really, really helps with this is Byron Katie's book called I Need Your Love. Is that true? I recommend like all of you right now read this fucking book. It is just so unbelievably appropriate and applicable to the concept or the, the concepts that we're talking about right here. This fear of like the other person will leave me. That book is basically an, an antidote to fears of like, oh God, what if my partner leaves me? What if I end up all alone? That book is basically permission to be okay without needing somebody else. It's basically saying, look, can I just be enough as I am by myself? Do I have to have a fucking partner, another human being to complete me? 
Isn't that unfair on the other person? I'm putting a massive burden on them saying, hey, you're responsible for my happiness, motherfucker. Hey, I'm not gonna be happy if you get frustrated with me. And that's essentially what this performance anxiety or this fear can manifest as, right? You're basically saying, listen, I'm not gonna be happy if you ever get frustrated with my performance. I'm not gonna be happy if you ever fucking leave me. So you better not fucking leave me because then I'll be miserable and you'll, that'll be on you. You'll feel guilty. And I know not all of you are like saying that to your partners. Most of us never do. We keep it up here, right? We keep it in our fucking heart. But that's what it sort of manifests as. It manifests as like you do little bits of controlling behavior. And that doesn't mean that you'll control your partner. Most of the time, what most of us do is we control ourselves, which is what performance anxiety or, or how it can manifest, right? I have to do a good job. I have to do everything. I have to learn. I can never give myself permission to suck. I have to be perfect the whole time. I have to constantly check to make sure they're having fun. I, and if they're ever not having fun, I have to beat myself up and fix it. Like we can sometimes control ourselves because we're so afraid of being alone. We're so afraid of someone rejecting us. We're so afraid of someone not wanting the same thing that we want and then they go their own separate way. But this book, again, it's called I Need Your Love. Is that true? It's by Byron Katie. I really recommend all of you read that book. It's just, oh my God, it's like the best book I've ever read for abundance mentality, for stoicism, for a lot of the red pill concepts of being okay on your own, not needing a partner to complete you all of that kind of stuff. So on top of that, I would also recommend just self-improvement in general, throw yourself into your goals, some sort of purpose. You don't even have to know what the big purpose is. Right now, the purpose can just be, I wanna lose 10 pounds over the next three months. That's a beautiful purpose, go for that. Spend time with your friends. The more you build out your own independent life, which is something that I talk about all this on this channel all the time, it applies to relationships, obviously, but it even just applies to casual sex as well. The more you build out your independence, <clears throat> you're not so desperate for someone to stick with you for you to be happy. And so a lot of the performance anxiety for me went away when I just embraced the idea that it's okay if someone doesn't like me. It's okay if someone thinks I'm shit in bed. It doesn't have to say anything bad about me. Maybe they just were looking for something different. Or maybe there was a billion other reasons why they didn't want to be with me. And I'm just imagining that it was because I'm bad in bed. I mean, that happens too. I feel like less of a man because I can't perform in the bedroom like I used to. It's like my entire sense of self-worth is tied up in my ability to get and maintain an erection. So this was a big one for me. This sort of comes from my brain. When I left my first or my second relationship, there was a lot of comfort in the relationship. It was part of why I left because I was very complacent and so was she and there were other reasons, but there was a lot of comfort. And so I didn't really have any performance anxiety in my long-term relationships. I think most people in a long-term relationship don't have any anxiety. But then when I went into or started having casual sex, oh my God, I was so anxious. And I was like, holy fuck, I used to just be chill about sex because I wasn't trying to perform. Now I'm scared. And so for a lot of you, that'll be applicable. And obviously the answer is just keep practicing, do all of the other stuff that I said before. But I think the first part in this question, and this is the reason that I wrote this, it, it came from my brain, but I've heard other people say this as well. The part about, I feel like less of a man, right? And lots of women will feel the same when they have their own performance anxiety and their own feelings of like, God, I got to be pretty. I got to do a good job for them. It's like, you know, a lot of fear of not being pretty enough, not being feminine enough. I guess that's a fear of not being a woman, right? And so we'll just address the fear of not being a man. The concept of masculinity, the concept of like an alpha male, the concept of like a Chad, the concept of like, be a real man. And all of these, I, I've done so much content on this. All of these concepts understand they're subjective. A label of like what a man is, is completely and utterly subjective. There is no objective, this is what a real man is. If you want proof of this, go back and look out through, go back and look throughout human history and see how that definition of a man has changed. Now, look through different countries in the current time and you will see that the definition of a man varies. In your same fucking culture, like, like within your fucking country, look at different families and stuff and different families, even in the same culture, in the same country, in the same time period, different families will have a different idea of what a man is, right? If you're a 20 year old guy, your idea of what a man is, is maybe someone who's <clears throat> a little bit irrational, a little bit like, fuck yeah, man, let's fucking go. Like over the top crazy, 
that is going to be a completely different definition of what a real man is compared to like a 60 year old man, right? A 60 year old man, his idea of a man might be something like you're a pillar of the community. You look after your grandchildren and young kids. You are a patriarch, you mentor, you're very kind to women, you nurture them. Um, you listen to other people, like you're very empathetic, you're very patient and peaceful. Like the definition of a man is just so fucking nebulous because it's a subjective term. The same thing applies to women, by the way, right? If you're a hardcore feminist or you roll in those circles, an idea of what a real woman is, is someone who like fights the fucking patriarchy. Like you're just aggressive. Like you go for what you want. You're like a boss bitch, like all of that kind of stuff. That will vary, that will be completely different to if you're like, I don't know, in a traditional European or Asian country and you're growing up in a family. There, the definition of a real woman is someone who cooks and cleans and has a pleasant demeanor and is sweet and agreeable and never argues. Like, do you see how these definitions are completely nebulous? That's by design, they're subjective terms. It's why I try to never tell you guys and girls what you should do and I instead just say, what do you want to do? I do this in my coaching program all the time. People will ask this question all the time. Half of you on the YouTube comments ask this. You use the word should. You say like, what should I do? And I'll always say, there are no shoulds. Do whatever you want. If you're asking me for a suggestion, you could try this and then try that, see if that works, blah, blah, blah. Like I'll give you suggestions, but I'm never gonna tell you what you should do because I don't believe in that because these terms are so nebulous and ever changing. So the idea of like, I'm less of a man, what I would get you to do is Instead of just using vague terms like I'm not a man, which is what I used to say about myself, that's still having a losing mindset. We're here to win, yeah? So instead of saying I feel like less of a man, write down a list of traits of what in your mind, this has to be you, what you would like a man to be or you would like yourself as a man to be and then start slowly improving those traits over time. So rather than saying, you know, I feel like less of a man, figure out what a man would be for you. And part of that might be, you know, I'm confident in the bedroom. Okay, rather than beating yourself up for not being confident in the bedroom, realize that confidence and really just like skill in the bedroom is something that you can just, well, it is that, it's a skill, so you can level it up, you can practice it, you can get slowly better over time. Part of that process means you might need to humble yourself and say, right now I suck, that's okay. I'll slowly improve. I'll just get a little bit better over time. But it's a skill. If something that you want is to be able to please your partner, rather than saying, you know, I'm not a man because I can't please my partner, you instead say, okay, what would someone, what do I believe someone who pleases their partner would do? And then I'll just do those traits. And I might suck at them. Like I might need to learn how to do them, but I'll just slowly improve. I have so much content on my website. I have so much content on this YouTube channel, on my podcast, on how to improve these skills, how to improve your confidence how to improve your sense of self as a man. And again, this applies to women too. You know, how to improve your bedroom skills. I have so much fucking free content on how to get better at sex itself, God. But realize these are just traits and you slowly improve them over time. Progress, not perfection. All right, and this is a common one that I've heard from quite a few guys. And I've heard some women say this too, but again, we're just addressing men in particular. I feel like I don't even want to try to have sex because I'm so scared of failing. It's like I'm too anxious to even attempt it. Yeah, I've heard that a lot. And, and how many of you out there maybe are self-sabotaging or you know, maybe you're talking to some women or you're on Tinder or whatever, but in the back of your mind, you're like, what's even the point? Because even if I go on a date and I'll probably be so fucking nervous and scared on the date, but even if I go through that whole process, when we get to the bedroom, like it's gonna suck. I'm gonna do a bad job. So what's even the point? Like what's the payoff? And so many women do the same thing where they're like, I have, you know, maybe boundary issues or I have, I've been through some trauma or something. I don't feel like I can fully open up in the bedroom. So what's even the point of trying to date? And so we sort of close ourselves off and we won't put ourselves out there because we're afraid of failing. Now, what have I said on this channel a million times? Rather than playing not to lose, which is what this is. So rather than like avoiding failure of like, oh my God, I don't want to fail. So I shouldn't even play the game. No, we're here to win. And so get in there, put some skin in the game, actually try it. But part of this process is giving yourself permission to suck. You know, the thing that you're afraid of, of like failing or doing a bad job, kind of embrace that. 
right? If you're someone that has some performance anxiety or you have some past trauma or you just don't have a lot of experience at sex, if right now you don't feel like you're good at sex, embrace that. Like I can, I can put it to you like this. And I've said this to so many of my coaching clients. I love, I, I wish sometimes I wish you the audience right now. I wish this was a coaching call rather than just me talking like at you because then we could go back and forwards. It's one of the weird things about YouTube and podcasts is I'm just talking at you. I don't get to have a conversation with you. It's kind of strange, but one of my favorite exercises on coaching calls is I say to the person who's anxious, you know, they've got this performance anxiety. I'll say, Right now, could you even, like, are you capable of doing a good job in the bedroom? Like, can you be good at sex right now? Can you do a good job? And they'll sit there and they'll think about it and they'll, they'll you know, sheepishly admit, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't think so. And I'll go, okay, so that is the current reality as we both see it. You cannot be good at sex right now in this moment. You can be good at sex in the future. That just takes practice and, you know, working through it. But right now you can't be good at sex. Am I hearing that correctly? And they say, yes. And then I say, so why the fuck do you have an arrogant expectation of yourself that you should be good at sex right now? What the fuck? That's like looking at a child who can't walk yet and going, you should be able to tie your shoelaces. What's, what's wrong with you? Why can't you tie your shoelaces? You, you know what? You probably shouldn't even bother wearing shoes. You probably shouldn't even bother going outside. You should probably just not even bother interacting with other human beings if you can't already tie your shoelaces. And the little baby's like looking up at you, like crying. And you're just like, you're not good enough. What the fuck is wrong with you? It's like, no, we wouldn't. We, we expect that that child has to learn. We expect that they suck right now at tying their shoes or walking or whatever it might be. And yet with performance anxiety and things like this, we put these unrealistic, insane, insane expectations on ourselves that we should be good at something that by our own admission, we are not good at. We literally say, I'm not good at this, but I should be. And it's like, but you're not, but I should be, but you're not, but I should be fucking hell. It's like, if you looked at one plus one is two and you were like, it should be three. And it's like, okay, but it's two though. Yeah, but it should be three. Why the fuck is it two? It should be three. It should just be three. And it's like, but it, bro, this is like mathematics. This is like the building blocks of the universe. It's one plus one is two. No, but it should be three though. It fucking shouldn't be two. Two's not good enough. Why the fuck is it two? I'm not even going to bother with this mass bullshit. No, this is bullshit. It should be three. That's what we're doing when we say I'm bad at sex, but I should be good at it. You're fucking not. And so embrace that, own that. And you don't have to stay as that. I wouldn't make that your identity. Like don't maybe for the rest of your life go, I'm shit at sex. Yay me. Like, you know, don't become an incel, so to speak. Like that's something that sort of incels and black pill people and, and that sort of thing they do, right? They, they grab onto that label and they hold onto it and they say, I'm in incel and I'm never going to have sex and I'm never going to get romance. That's me. And they don't do anything to change it. So to be clear, I'm not saying grab this label and keep it. This is more an acceptance of where we currently are. And then a pathway or a plan, just a little bit of practice to get to that place that we want to go to, right? In other words, this is your map. If you're looking at a map, if you're trying to get directions to somewhere, your map software, you know, Google Maps, Apple Maps, whatever, it has to know where you currently are in order to get you to your destination. And so if right now you don't feel like you're good at sex, accept that. That is your current desti that is your current location. And then your destination is to get somewhere decent. You want to be decent at sex. So acceptance of where you are right now and not putting this insane, arrogant, crazy, insane. <laughs> batshit crazy expectation on yourself that you should be good at something when all of the evidence in your life and through your own mouth says that you're not good at it. I addressed this one a second ago, but I'm too scared to even talk to girls because what's the point? Even if we end up in bed, my dick won't work. Like I said, I just covered that here to really emphasize it even more. The point is to get better. Basically saying I'm too scared to talk to girls because I'm not going to do a good job. So why should I talk to girls? It's like, the way that you get good with girls, the way that you get good in bed, the way you, that you get comfortable with sex and the way that you get comfortable with your own body and intimacy and all of this is practice. You're literally saying, I don't want to do the thing that will get me to a point of being good because I'm not good. That's like saying, I'm never going to practice running a marathon because I don't know how to finish a marathon. And it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Or if a little baby, like I said in the example before, if a little baby was like, I'm not going to practice tying my shoelaces because I don't know how to tie my shoelaces. You'd be like, oh, 
what the fuck? How do you think you get better at it? And so again, you have to sort of accept, I mean, you don't have to do anything, but if you want this to improve, you might, you are going to have to accept that right now you probably suck. That's why I say, give yourself permission to suck. Embrace the suck. Embrace the fact that right now your dick might not work in the bedroom. You might not do a good job and then practice and it will get better in the same way as a kid learning to tie their shoelaces is going to fuck it up. It's not even fucking it up because they're learning, right? But you know, in your mind, you might say it's a fuck up or a failure or a mistake. I, I don't tend to think in those terms, but a little kid tying their shoelaces might fuck it up 50 or a hundred or a thousand times and then they figure it out. And so be okay with your dick not working. You might happen a hundred times. That's okay. That's okay. I've got so much content on erectile dysfunction, on performance anxiety, on walking you through how it's okay. You just do other things. You know, that's something else that we haven't even talked about in this podcast or in this video here today. When you have this performance anxiety, there's a million other things that you can do. Like if it's centered around your penis or if you're a woman, if you have performance anxiety around like penetrative, penetrative sex or any other sex act, just do it any of the fucking 10 million other sex acts that there are. There are so many different things. And that's just in the vanilla sex world. If we then start adding in a little bit of kink, a little bit of BDSM, oh my God, there's like a billion things that you can do in the bedroom. There's a billion things. Do you guys know how many times I have sex in an average month where I don't use my penis? I swear to God, it's like 30%. Sometimes it's like 50%. Of the time. I've gone through periods where I'm super stressed. I have all this shit going on. I just like don't have sex for a month. But you ask my girlfriend Imogen, you ask the girls that we sleep with, they will tell you like, no, we had sex because we did other things. My dick just didn't go in them, but we were still having sex. So there's such a wide world out there. Don't limit yourself just to your genitals. You are more than just your genitals. This next one is very similar to a previous one, but with a subtle distinction. So it's hard because I feel like I'm not living up to societal expectations of what a man should be. It's like I'm failing at one of the most basic aspects of masculinity. Yes. Yeah, so the key distinction here between the previous one or one of the previous ones is societal expectations. Fuck society. Like I love society. I'll be very clear. But if this helps you, fuck society. Put that in your head. Fuck society. What the fuck do I give a shit about society? Like, why do I give a fuck? Again, I love society to bits, but this mindset might help you to sort of think, what are the average people doing in society? Go around and look at the average person in society. They're doing a pretty good job. Like they're doing their best, but they are obese. They're working a job that like, maybe it's okay, but it's not like their passion for the vast majority of human beings. It's not their hardcore passion. They're earning enough money to survive, but they're not like flourishing. Their sexual relationships are like decent, but like, it's not like they're becoming a fucking sex God or something like that. Their travel is like, they travel around a little bit and have fun, you know, maybe go on a couple of vacations, but they're not like exploring the whole world. Like, again, we're talking about average. We're not talking about the exceptions, but the average is by definition average. The average person just wants to be normal. They want to be safe. They want to be happy. They just want to be like sort of complacent, kind of like plugged into the matrix. And that isn't a bad thing. It's what they want. I think that's beautiful that they know what they want, but if you're watching this content, you're probably not going for the average life. And that doesn't mean you're better than anyone else. That doesn't mean we're better than average people or anything like that, but you're not really fully integrated. At least a lot of you are not really fully integrated in what society wants for you. You're watching this weird fucking, you know, bold guy on YouTube talking about sex and BDSM and kink and exploring and making money and doing all this cool shit and changing your mindset and embracing your fear of death. Do you think the average person, do you think society embraces their fear of death? No, literally everyone is playing this collective game of pretending that they're not all going to die one day. You probably do it too. I do it from time to time, right? And so you probably just aren't living on completely the same plane of existence as the rest of society. That doesn't mean you're cut off from society. That doesn't mean like, you know, fuck you society. I know I said, fuck you society earlier. That was sort of a mindset trick to snap you out of this stuff, but you're probably not, at least I'm personally not. And all of my clients, and I think probably a chunk of you are not fully meshed in with society. So what do you care what society's expectations are? The only expectation of what a man or the only expectation, the only story of what a man is that I care about is your story. I literally only give a fuck what you think a man 
should be or what you want a man to be, what you want a man to be and embrace that. As for, you know, I'm failing at one of the most basic aspects of masculinity. So I want to give you a nice little mental trick here. When you were a child, were you winning at masculinity? No, probably not. <laughs> right? When you're, <laughs> when you're like three weeks old and you're literally shitting your fucking pants daily or every couple of days, hopefully daily, when you're shitting your pants, pissing your fucking pants, your little dick is like, this might be a weird thing to think about, but your little dick is like this fucking big, you don't have a big fucking donger. You can't walk. Women, I mean, they think you're fucking adorable. They think you're like the definition of like a beta male when you're a little baby, right? They're like, oh, he's so cute. He's a cute little boy. They're like patronizing you. They're doing it in a loving way. But like, you know, none of these things are masculine things. You can't get your own food. You don't have your own job. You're certainly like not doing anything of noteworthy, you know, in the world. You're not having a big impact on the world. You're adorable as shit, but you're not masculine. You're not manly, right? And so at some point you were failing. Failing. I don't like that word, but you were failing at every aspect of masculinity, a hundred percent of them, all of them, like all of them. There was no masculine thing that you were doing as a three week year old young boy, like you were fucking failing at all. And at the point where you're at right now, write out a list of maybe 10, 15, 20, write as many as you want. Even if it's just two, it doesn't matter. Write out some number or think about some number of aspects of masculinity that you f currently feel like you are winning or succeeding at, right? You, even if you just have one or two, just something that you're doing. Well, I have a job. Okay, good. You can support yourself. That's good. Well, I'm pretty nice to other people. Okay, cool. That means you're embracing that side, that paternal, caring, gentle side of masculine, that caregiver side of masculinity. And so write out a list or think of a list of things that you're currently succeeding at when it comes to masculinity. And now you can see where you started as a three year old failing at or three week old failing at everything to do with masculinity. And now where you are right now, there's a long fucking gap there. you've traveled quite a long road. You've improved a lot of your masculinity. And that's the key word you have improved. You've made progress. And so with this, this idea of being good in the bedroom or whatever expectations you might be putting on yourself, can't you just improve at that too? The same way that you learn to stop shitting your fucking pants and having women patronize you again, they're doing it in a loving, gentle way, but having women go like, who's a cute little boy. You got to a point where people started to respect you. I'm sure women don't walk up to you. Even if you don't feel like you have a ton of respect right now, women and people aren't walking up to you on the street and going, who's a cute little boy. Yes, you are. You boop, boop. Who's a cute little boy. Boop. <laughs> women aren't, aren't booping you on the fucking nose and pinching your cheeks and telling you that you're adorable. Are they? And so you've improved at that. So improve at this, this aspect of masculinity as in being decent in the bedroom. It's just like anything else. It's a fucking skill that you can learn. The next one is actually like comes up a lot and it speaks to the shame of this stuff. Even when people try to reassure me that it's normal to experience performance anxiety, I have a hard time actually believing them. It's like, I'm convinced that I'm the only one going through this. Yeah. Well, you're definitely fucking not. I have had performance anxiety a trillion times. I just don't care anymore. Most of my clients have had performance anxiety. Like I know I can't see right now, but put your hand up. I hope you're actually doing this. Put your hand up. If you've ever had performance anxiety, leave a comment with a hand emoji. If you've ever fucking had performance anxiety, women too. God damn it. Leave a comment. If you've ever had insecurity around your own performance in the bedroom, like I hope I do a good job. I hope I'm pretty. I hope I'm good at blowjobs. I hope he thinks that I'm nice. I hope I don't do anything wrong. I hope he doesn't think I'm a slut. I hope that my friends don't think I'm a slut. I hope that I, my pussy isn't ugly. I hope that he likes it shaved. Oh fuck. I forgot to shave for half a second. Does that mean he hates me now? Like, like <laughs> leave a comment. If you've ever had <laughs> performance anxiety, I don't think I need to say anything more than that. Hopefully some people leave comments, but even if nobody does, I promise you, you are not alone. This is again, one of those points where I really want to push you, you know, if you're willing to, I want to push you. If you've been on the fence about signing up for coaching, please fucking sign up for the coaching program. So many of the guys in the group, like right now and the past clients that we've had, which by the way, you get access to all the past clients. You can talk to them. So many of the guys and a couple of girls too have had performance anxiety. And I think you just, 
being around other people who've been through this shit and going, oh, whoa, like it isn't just me. I think it helps eliminate some of that or slowly dissolve some of that stigma, that feeling of I'm a special case. There's something wrong with me. I'm extra fucked up. You know, I've done so much content on my channel. You can just search for the word erectile dysfunction. I've done interviews with so many guys that have had erectile dysfunction and performance anxiety and we've talked through it and they've given their stories. So I think it'll really help you to see that it's not just you. You know, again, I'd love it if you jumped on a coaching call with me or sign up for the program so you can actually see that. But short of that, there's also my forums if you want to just ask on there and say, hey, who else has gone through this? All right, the next one. I worry that I'll never be able to overcome my performance anxiety and that it will ruin my sex life forever. It's like I'm stuck in this cycle of fear and self-doubt. Yeah, so like I said before, I think there was enough at the start of this podcast that maybe we don't need to go through it again. Play that out to its logical conclusion. You know, it'll ruin my sex life forever. Like play that out. Also, I guess another thing I can say here is like, holy shit, look at you. And, and it's okay. This is what we do as humans, right? We catastrophize and we say that something will always be like this, but holy fucking shit, look at you. And I used to say the same shit too. So I'm saying this to my old self as well. Look at you like saying that you can predict the fucking future. You know, this is gonna ruin my sex life forever. It's like, oh, can you tell me the lottery numbers like 10 years from now as well, since you seem to be able to predict the future. So I think the point that I'm making here is embrace that idea that you don't always know, that we don't always have all the answers. We can't predict the fucking future. And your mission isn't to predict the future or worry about the future or stress about what might happen for the rest of your life forever. Also, the statement isn't even true. We can play around with this and it's, it's kind of funny to do this. I do this with my coaching clients all the time and they love this. Whenever we have a fear of something happening forever, I always say like, no, one day you'll die. <laughs> like one day you'll be dead. So it won't go on forever, you'll die. And that might sound like a weird thing to say, but like there is some tiny little bit of peace in that. It's like, oh, I guess I'll be free from the suffering of this when I die. Okay, so there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, okay. Could I move that light a little bit closer? Like. If I can accept that when I die, I will have peace and freedom from my performance anxiety, could I make that happen a little bit earlier? Like not death, I'm not saying could you kill yourself, but could I release myself from this performance anxiety just a little bit earlier? Like if I say to you right now, do you think if you knew you had one week to live, you could let go of some of that performance anxiety? Like if, I, if a doctor literally said you're gonna die a week from now and you still had performance anxiety, do you think you could start to let some of that go? Of course you could. You have one week left to live. You're not gonna be sitting there going, but what if I can't please my partner? You'd be like, motherfucker, I'm dying in a week. I give up, I give up on this performance anxiety thing. Okay, so you admit that you can do it a little bit sooner than your death. Okay, could you do it a month earlier? Maybe you can do that. Could I do it a year earlier? Could I, for the last year of my life, let go of some of my performance anxiety? And I want all of you to pause the podcast and actually do this. Don't just listen to me because that's not the same. That's you just logically hearing me, but you're not emotionally feeling it. So please pause the podcast and do this exercise that I just gave you. If I had one week to live, doctor literally said you're gonna die in a week, how would I feel regarding my performance anxiety? And actually feel that. I want you to feel the release and the peace that comes, the lightening of the burden. Close your eyes, please pause this podcast and feel that. I hope you fucking did it. I'm gonna come and slap you. I won't really. But then play it out and go, okay, what about a month? What if I had a month to live? Again, pause the podcast and think about how I would feel. Feel it in your body. Actually do this. Please don't just listen to me saying this. Feel it. Take the time to fucking feel it. What would it feel like if I had one month to live, would I be able to let go of some of my performance anxiety? Okay, hopefully you did that. Now do it again a year. If I had one year left to live, do I think that I could let go of my performance anxiety? And feel it, feel that release, feel that lightening, feel that, that deep breath out and that feeling of, you know what? I give up, I give up on my performance anxiety. I don't need it. I'm gonna die a year from now. Fuck this performance anxiety. It's fine. It's fine that I'll never be good at sex. It's okay. I'm going to die. Okay. If that gave you some lightening of the burden, 
keep playing that out. Keep gently playing that out. Go like, okay, what about two years before my death? And you might hit some point where you're like, no, no, no. I think I wouldn't be able to let go of the performance anxiety at that point. Okay. What would you need to do differently? Do you need to improve your sexual skills? Would that help? Would you need to do some more meditating to help you let go of it? Would you need to read books like letting go and loving what is, and you can't afford the luxury of a negative thought? Would you need to do that to let go? Would you need to hit me up for coaching or some other coach? Like what would you need to do to let go of some of that? And then just start slowly doing that. And hopefully if you did pause the podcast and do it, just the very exercise of going, okay, one week before I die, could I let go of some of that burden and actually feeling it like letting out that sigh, that, that breath out, that releasing, hopefully that has in the present released even just 0.001% of your performance anxiety. And if it did, like if you did that and you felt just even the slightest, tiniest little bit of like an unburdening, even just 0.1%. Okay. What if you just did that exercise every day? Do you think that over time, maybe you'd let go of some of this performance anxiety? So you can try that. And if, if that didn't work for you, beautiful, that's okay. There's like 600 other things that I've given you in this podcast. And there's a million more things other than this podcast as well. Every problem has a solution, as I say all the time. So this is just something that you can improve, I promise. Last one is, I feel like I'm not able to fully express myself sexually because of my performance anxiety. It's affecting my self-esteem and confidence in other areas of my life too. Yeah, and part of this, so I definitely had this, I felt like I held back from a lot of things in the bedroom. Like for instance, I never tried BDSM or any kinky stuff because I was like, well, I feel anxiety with just normal sex. Like I definitely can't do any of that shit. So I was holding myself back I was holding myself back in terms of communication too, because I was like, well, I can't tell my partner that I'm scared of doing a good job because they think I'm needy and weak and beta. And I've done so much content on my channel on how to express your emotions as a man, like how to be vulnerable without losing that masculinity, you know, how to be vulnerable, but strong. And I'll give you the short rundown, the really, really, really quick version of it is you say the thing that you're scared of, or you say the anxiety or the thing you're struggling with, you say the vulnerable thing, and then you talk about what you're going to do to overcome it. And if you don't know what you're going to do to overcome it, your first step is, all right, I'm going to go and figure out what I'm going to do to overcome it. So what that would look like is like this. You could say to your partner, you know, I, I put a lot of pressure on myself to be good at sex. Like sometimes I'm up here in my head, like I'll be honest, even right now, you know, as we're having sex, like, I feel like I got to do a good job for you. Like I'm so fucking up here. So I think one thing I'm going to do to overcome this is I'm going to talk to some of my friends about this and see if they feel the same way. Um, I'm also probably going to Google it and just like, see like what the fix is. Cause I really want to like solve this. I want to work through this. So yeah. Anyway, um, do you ever feel anxious like about sex? There you go. That's how you do it. See how that still feels fucking masculine. It's you embracing the thing that you're scared of but you're also not just being completely helpless and hopeless and going, Oh my God, like, please help. Like you have to fix me. Oh my God, here's my, here's my burden. Like I'm going to dump it on you. You see how you're just sort of expressing your emotions and you're basically allowing that room to say, and I'm going to be okay. That's even a solution too. You can say, you know, I'm really nervous um, during sex. Like uh, I put this pressure on myself, but yeah, like I know I'm going to be okay. Like, like that, that's fucking good. So there's plenty of ways to express yourself while still retaining that masculinity. So hopefully this podcast was helpful, but I have a full on performance anxiety and erectile dysfunction article on my website. I really recommend you go and read that. So just go to killyourandaloser.com. Just search for performance anxiety or erectile dysfunction. I've got a full article on this. I have so many ideas in that. There's like 15 different dot points of like ways to actually address the performance anxiety. This video here today was more the mindset, but that article that I'm talking about literally has like actionable steps that you can take. Like here is literally what to do in the bedroom. And I have some like really interesting and out there ideas. Like if you struggle with erectile dysfunction as a guy, one of my favorite, my favorite idea is obviously just do other things like finger, go down on each other, cuddle, like do everything except sex. But my second favorite is put a blindfold on her. And that might seem like, bro, what the fuck has that got to do with erectile dysfunction? When she's blindfolded, there's so much less pressure on you for your dick to get hard, right? You're not sitting there going, oh my God, she can see my dick. Oh my God. Like you're not self-conscious. 
pretty much everyone or most people will tell you that when the lights are off, they feel a lot less self-conscious and they feel a lot more comfortable with their body during sex versus when the lights are on. Right? It doesn't apply to everyone, but I think 99% of people would agree with that because someone's not looking at your insecurities. They can't see them, like it's not right there. And so blindfold is probably my most interesting or funnest idea that I have. So again, that's on my website. Other things you can do is take the pressure off yourself to perform, give yourself permission to suck, do everything, like I said, except using your dick. Use your fingers, use your tongue. A Little bit of that action. I'm sorry for that, by the way. Somebody's probably gonna clip that. Clip that and make that into a shot. There you go. Put some music over the top of it, send it to me. Turn the lights off, like I said. Turning the lights off can help a hell of a lot with um, performance anxiety. If you have any other insecurities other than what we've talked about, feel free to leave them in the comment. Like if it, leave them in the comments if there's something that I didn't sort of cover here, if you have your own sort of concern, but I think we covered most of them. These are sort of the ones that came to mind when I thought about what I've thought about in the past and what my clients have said to me. So I hope this was helpful. If you would like more help with this, I obviously have coaching. I would love to sit down with you, go over any of this sort of stuff or anything else you wanna work on. I'm offering right now one-off coaching calls. We also have our hardcore 12 week coaching program. We have payment plans if you need them. Everybody in the group is super supportive, non-judgmental. We have four coaches, yes, four coaches right now that you will get access to. I am at some point gonna sit down and record a video with all three of those coaches and myself. I can tell you their names now. Cam is obviously one of them. Ed is another one of them. Any of you who followed Ed's journey over the last couple of years and Taylor, is the last one. Taylor has come leaps and bounds in the last year. Absolutely fucking insane. Can Taylor just like speed run, sped run, speed run, speed run his progress to becoming a coach. Like, holy fucking shit. Like a year ago, oh my God. Like he came to me for coaching a year ago and now he's like literally at this place of like peace and acceptance and love and joy. He gives so much to the coaching clients. It's fucking amazing. So again, if you sign up for the coaching program, you get access to four coaches. Holy fucking shit. How insane is that? I've said this a million times. My prices are going up. Like the idea that I'm, that we have four coaches in the program is fucking psychotic. Like you get access to four coaches. That's fucking insane on top of everything else. So the price is going up. Jump on that before you miss out. Link in the description below. As always, go out there and crush your goals and give yourself permission to suck while you do it.